Hi guys. Okay, so uh, AS Level English, um, this is basically a video that uh, anybody can kind of watch. I'm just going to do kind of a, a recap um, and just kind of go over uh, some of the things to think about when we're analyzing a piece of text. So uh, I'm not sure. I've, I've got a basic structure of where I want to take this video. I'm just going to touch on the things to look for this is not specific to any text uh, in mind this is kind of going to be uh, generally things to think about uh, when we're looking at textual analysis because we know that basically textual analysis is pretty much the biggest part of uh, what we you know what we have to do for AS level english and it, it really is the toughest. Um, I always uh, tell students in that uh, to think about or to go back, uh, to go back and have a look um, at uh, question 2D. Uh, and uh, if you go to IGCSE success, um, uh, teacher Ash, he's got some amazing videos on his channel uh, on, on how to do textual analysis at GCSE level. Um, at AS level, we're basically taking all of the, the lessons that we've learned in GCSEs in terms of textual analysis and, and question uh, 2C and questions 2D, and we're now expanding it. Okay, we're taking a little bit further. So uh, let's jump right in. Okay, so the question is going to ask you, okay, about the form, the structure, and the language. Okay, and remember, there's three questions that you need to be thinking about when it comes to textual analysis. On the paper one, okay, that question uh, 1B. Paper two, pure analysis. And then uh, on uh, paper, uh, sorry, uh, question two on paper one and paper two, uh, question uh, 1B, that reflective commentary. Okay, uh, again, all forms of analysis and, and all having their own ways of writing. Um, and I'm sure that at some stage I'll be doing uh, videos on uh, reflective commentary and comparative commentary. But for now, I just want to basically go over, because when it comes to textual analysis, all of the effects that we learn in our writing are effects that we need to be able to recreate in our own writing. So we need to be able to recreate those effects. Okay. Um, so let's uh, let's just jump in. I'm going to start uh, taking a look uh, I, uh, at uh, uh, form and structure. Okay. Uh, then we'll have a look at a couple of uh, language techniques to think about, um, and uh, I might uh, gloss over some of the things uh, that we've practiced uh, in cl my classes, at least uh, on. Uh, 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 shooting an elephant um, and again when it comes to AS level and textual analysis uh, another uh, channel that definitely is worth going out and seeing uh, is uh, Engilearn um, I will try and put the links into the bottom of the video here I'm still kind of getting this whole video thing going so the idea being is that you can also click on the teacher Adna's page. Teacher Adna is absolutely brilliant. Uh, she knows exactly what she's doing. So um, I'm also using the Cambridge textbook uh, to help support me with, with a lot of this. Uh, and you can buy the textbook or you can download the textbook um, as well if, uh, if you wanted to. Obviously, you're going to have to get that directly from Cambridge or your local distributor okay so uh, let's get going so. so in the old textbook we would always talk about the style of the text okay 
And it was a bit fuzzy. Because kind of style was everything. Okay. Well, style kind of like took, was basically form, structure, and language. So the name, the question has changed and just made it more clearer for the students. The information that we want to extract from the text is still pretty much the same. We're still kind of looking for those things that basically give that specific text its unique uh, 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 and special something. And I, I always use the example of, of Agatha Christie because I'm, I'm a big fan of her, her books. I mean, I, I grew up with, with Agatha Christie um, or, or Ruth Rendell. And, and those are two great examples. They both uh, kind of whodunit murder mystery type style books. But Agatha Christie's style of writing is quite plain and quite simple. Um, you know, she's her structure of uh, the, you know, her texts are, are very straightforward, where they might be a little bit more complicated when it comes to Ruth Rendell. Love both authors. Both authors are, are absolutely brilliant. And obviously, I encourage students to read because it is going to develop uh, your ability to analyze a piece of text uh, and your vocabulary, which you're going to need. But they are both writing the same type of story, murder mysteries, but they each write differently. And if you had to put a uh, a page of, uh, you know, of an Agatha Christie book in front of me, uh, you know, and maybe hidden the names of the characters, I'd immediately be able to identify it because of the way that she writes. She has a very specific way that she writes and her vocabulary is quite specific and her sentence structures, uh, uh, you know, are very, very specific. So that... Is, is, is what they mean by kind of the style of the text. Okay. So, when we are doing analysis, our job is to uh, look for that uh, effect. Okay. The effect that is created by language features, devices, patterns. Okay. Um, uh, choice of tense the formality of the language, uh, and uh, at the end of the video, I am going to share a, a list uh, of things that you can basically look for in a text, kind of like a, a checklist. Okay, so the question is form, structure, and language. So let's break down form. So form is the shape of the text. Okay, the way the text is kind of put together. Um, and the best way to describe this would be, say, uh, a, a poem, okay? Uh, little Mary uh, had a lamb, its fleece was white as snow, everywhere that Mary went, it's, uh, the lamb was sure to go, okay? So it's got it rhymes, but it's basically kind of, I think, four lines was Mary had a little lamb. Um, the sentences are, you know, quite short, um, you know, and it tells you basically the story of Mary's little lamb that followed her everywhere she went. Now, you compare that uh, to, say, um, uh, a speech by Barack Obama. Uh, those are two very, very different types of text. Okay? I mean... The speech might still have paragraphs, okay? But the language perhaps might be a little bit more formal. But when it comes to the shape and the organization of it, okay, the way that the paragraphs are structured, the way that they are set out, the sentences, those are basically the how all the information is organized in the text. Those are the things that we need to take into consideration. Uh, I just use the, the, the Google Meet so that you guys can actually see my face because 
the way this records, it only records what you see on my screen. Okay, so, back. Okay, <clears throat> so, in textual analysis, we're focusing on effects created by the form and structure and the language. And then the structure and form is what we're going to go and look at next. Okay. So, there's a good example. Uh, a brochure. Okay, thinking about a brochure, how different the information in a brochure would be to perhaps a news article. Okay, those are the things that help us identify the type of text uh, that, uh, you know, we are looking at. So when it comes to kind of uh, the structure, okay, remember, and structure and form, they're going to be connected. Okay, now, this is why knowing your key conventions is so vitally important. Okay, you need to know the key conventions of different types of texts, from a narrative text to an article to a letter to a um, to an interview. All those texts that you studied at GCSEs. Okay, so things to think about when it comes to the structure. So, for example, flashback. Now, that you might find more in a piece of narrative text, okay? Um, or is, uh, uh, you know, something that you might find in a piece of text, flashback being kind of like uh, when an author uh, kind of uh, uh, takes you back in time, okay, to a specific moment and then perhaps returns you later on in the story, okay? So, that flashback which would give you as the, the, the reader, okay, a certain amount uh, of context, okay. Mainly, again, uh, you'd find that in uh, narrative texts, uh, but you might find that a, a writer might do it in an article, perhaps, okay. Uh, you might find that, uh, you, you know, something like that might appear in a blog. But as I say, generally, you're going to find it inside a, um, a narrative piece of text. Foreshadowing, foreshadowing, basically where we supply you with a certain amount of information, maybe not giving you the full story, but preparing you for something. Okay, preparing you for something. So kind of like uh, almost feeding you a certain amount of information to create Perhaps an ominous effect, okay? Uh, um, I mean, the shadow always makes, reminds me of, uh, you know, the word foreshadowing because you kind of think of shadows and mist and dark places. And, you know, that kind of starts making you think, oh, this could be a scary story, for example. So you might start creating these effects earlier on or the writer might start creating those effects earlier on Okay, which will be confirmed later on by something within the text. Okay, zooming in and out. Okay, uh, and you know, this is where basically you might find uh, the writer zoning in on something very specific. Okay, and uh, the text that uh, we have here actually is, is not an altogether terrible example. Okay, uh, just looking at this first part, she explored the woods behind the house many times, giving us a bit of context. Often in late autumn, her mother took her to gather nuts. Today, so a bit of a change in time, so this is kind of like, it's not necessarily for a flashback, okay. Uh, it might be for the protagonist, but uh, uh, it's more context that the writer is creating for us here, Okay. And she goes on about basically she's running through the woods and she found in addition to various common but pretty ferns and leaves an armful of strange blue flowers. So you can see how the character has basically or how the audience is now being made to zoom in. 
not just from the forest and the running around and collecting the nuts, but actually zooming in on the blue flowers with velvety ridges. Okay, strange blue flowers with velvety ridges. So that is kind of like that zooming in effect. Okay, dialogue. Uh, whenever you spot dialogue in the text, uh, if the, the dialogue's done properly, okay, remember every time somebody speaks, okay, it must be in a, a new sentence, okay, a new paragraph rather. So dialogue definitely is structural. Okay, there's something to take into account, as is the, the internal monologue. <clears throat> and that's going to end, you know, that's going to be the, the point of view. It's going gonna, it's gonna to help you understand some of the perspective. And please, guys, please, 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 remember when it comes to dialogue, okay, dialogue is used by a writer, okay, to... Uh, describe the character to give you an understanding of who the character is, uh, to give you an understanding of their environment. Okay, dialogue should not be "Hi, how are you? I'm fine. How are you?" because that's going to be, uh, you know, um, it's not going to allow your audience to understand, you know, who is the character that's speaking. We want to know more about the character, so that that kind of helps with characterization in many ways. Okay, that internal monologue that allows us to kind of see that thinking, uh, the thoughts kind of going through the head of the, the protagonist, perhaps, in the text. Character introduction, every time they introduce a new character, okay, uh, that's definitely going to be a structural event, okay. Um, uh, again, also the same with your introduction of your setting, Okay, your environment. So as soon as there's a, a change in setting, now it's a, a change to perhaps, uh, you know, it's a different place or a different time. Short sentences and long sentences and students tend to pick up on these far quicker. Okay, I mean, stop! Exclamation mark. Okay, new paragraph. Well, here you've got a, a, an incomplete sentence, I suppose, to a certain degree. The word stop, it's an imperative, okay? Um, it's, it's in its own sentence, it's in its own paragraph, and it's definitely going to be uh, something to think about when it comes to the effect it may create within the text, okay? Short and long sentences, short and long paragraphs, they're going to uh, influence the pace of the text, Okay, lots of short sentences, one after the other, will make perhaps make the text a little bit faster. And a longer sentence might just slow things down so that uh, you have a, um, you know, so that the, the, the reader has to, to spend more time reading a more complex sentence. Okay, listing, okay, now... Listing is a structural effect, but also a language effect. Think about uh, in persuasive writing, you might list a couple of things. Okay, so it does have a structure. It is also seen as a structural device as well. Okay, shift in focus. Okay, now shift in focus is different to zooming in and zooming out. Okay, the shift in focus is where perhaps, uh, you know, <coughs> I always think of it as, <coughs> you know, doing the dishes and you're kind of washing the dishes and you're looking down at the dishes and then you look up and you look through the window uh, and uh, uh, you see the, the neighbor, um, you know, I don't know, put it, you know, dancing in their clown outfit, okay, uh, in the house across from you, uh, you know, as they run around uh, the room being chased by small cats, dogs, and uh, a very large gerbil, okay? So you've gone from this focus of, here I am washing the dishes, I look up, I see across to the other side of the house, somebody else's house, and this, uh, you know, a, a different scene is explored, 
Okay, so that's more of a shift in focus. So it's kind of like a, a complete shift uh, and normally would appear in its own paragraph. Okay, the, the writer would basically complete the paragraph of where you are and then perhaps blend nicely into that shift of focus into now seeing something completely different. Oh, I I've missed out punctuation. Punctuation, guys, it's structural. Okay, punctuation creates its own effects. Okay, um, contrast. Uh, how good, goodness gracious, guys, if you see any type of contrast, okay, take note of it. It's definitely going to be worth discussing. Chronology. Now, uh, this text again in front of us, wonderful for chronology. She had explored, okay, that past perfect, uh, often in the past, okay, and today, Okay, and here we have this kind of like chronology of time. And then we get later on a change in focus when she moves to by 12 o'clock. It's quite a specific time, but there is a certain type of chronology happening through the text. And that chronology is going to be supported uh, by tenses. Okay, and guys, know your, at least know your basic 12 tenses. Okay, be able to identify them in sentences. They are important. Okay, point of view and perspective, absolutely. Okay, vital. The point of, uh, is it first person, third person? We hardly ever see second person. Okay, and guys at GCSE level, we were okay with you using that first person perspective. But at AS level, if you're writing, you want to be uh, writing, you know, practicing your third person perspective writing. Remember, you know, now is the time to practice and to pick up on your mistakes. <clears throat> okay, um, let's see. Repetition. So repetition listing. Okay, again, uh, structural effects for persuasive writing. Okay. But if certain images are being repeated, okay, or similar images, semantic images, let's put it that way, then that's definitely something you want to uh, take note of. Uh, the toy turning point or the climax in a piece of text, okay, uh, that is something definitely worth having a look at. And then uh, perhaps extended metaphors, okay. Uh, and at the end of this, we'll have a look at a, a, a nice list of some of the things that you might, other things that you might want to consider when it comes to structural devices. Okay. So those are the structural things. Now, you must remember, you must remember, Annette, that within a piece of text, you're not always going to be seeing everything and you most certainly are not going to be writing about everything. Okay? You're definitely not going to be writing about everything. Because you only have a limited amount of time for the actual analysis side. So you need to think which are going to be the most effective. You know, where are there lots of examples of this? Okay, because that's going to help you to be able to discuss it at length. Okay, remember you've got that minimum 600 words that you need to meet. Okay, um, so let's go on and have a look at some language devices. Okay. Um, okay, skippy skip. Okay, so know what a verb is, know what an adjective, know what a noun is, okay? You want to be able to identify them in text, especially when you've got a strong adjective, okay? So you do need to know uh, your, your, your types of words, okay? You do need to know your types of words. Okay, and I think we explore that more here. Okay. So.
so. So the key things that you need to be trying to identify inside a piece of language, okay? So remember what your focus is. Your focus is the effects created by the writer, okay? The effects created by the writer, okay? And, and they go on here talking about the, 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 the style of the text, kind of like all of those little spices that you put into your food to make your food taste good, okay? So the things that you need to be kind of looking at is Lexus, okay? And no, Lexus is not the car, okay? Lexus is the language uh, that is basically being used, okay? That group of words that you bring together, okay? And how they fit together, okay? Uh, how those words fit together. And I mean, it could be, you know, idiomatic uh, combinations of how certain words come together to produce ideas, okay? Um, then we've got grammar as well, okay? So the way that words are kind of put together to make sentences, very similar to the Lexus, but Lexus is that focus of certain words that come together to do specific things, okay? Grammar is more about how those words fit together, okay? Sentence variety, guys, if you see it, you're going to be writing about it. Figurative language, okay? Those are all your similes, animatopoeia, uh, those types of things, and, and any other kind of linguistic devices, kind of sound, rhythm, okay? Uh, tenses, punctuation, and... As much as we want to see these different effects on their own, you've got to remember that these, effect, these effects are created okay, in unison with both structural devices and language devices. Okay? I mean, uh, you, know, you can't basically uh, make, a, make pancakes where basically you fry the egg and then kind of uh, you know, uh, mix the... the, the the, the butter and the flour and, you know, uh, try and cook that separately and then put the fried egg together, uh, you know, with the, 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 the milk and the flour because you'd probably just get like, I don't know, a flat bread with an egg, something like that. Okay, and that wouldn't be a pancake. Okay, so you, these ideas come together, okay, in unison. Okay, so keep those kinds of ideas in mind. Okay, so here is a kind of a checklist, okay, that I kind of like to use uh, when I'm analyzing text. So it's basically questions you want to be asking yourself. Okay, so what type of text are you dealing with? You know, I mean, if it's an advert, for example, you're going to be looking for, uh, you know, persuasive effects. Okay. If it's a speech, depending on the text type of the speech, okay, what types of uh, language effects would be created in a speech? Remembering that a speech is spoken directly to an audience, so it's going to affect it. Okay. Um, those key conventions of that text type, make sure you study your key conventions, okay? And, and keep in mind that Cambridge, uh, in all of the exams, they like to combine, so they find texts where there's a combination of those key conventions. So, for example, perhaps a persuasive blog. So, you have to be able to discuss uh, the blog and... Uh, the effects of persuasive writing or uh, a narrative that is autobiographical, you know, and very similar to kind of shooting an elephant by George Orwell, for example. 
Okay, the register, how formal is the text? Okay, what is the formality of the language? Okay, then we've got context. And we always talk about uh, form and context and pragmatics. And things like, when was the text produced? And that you may be able to identify in some of the words that, or, you know, that are being used at the time. Okay. Who is the intended audience? Okay, audience. I try and identify your audience. Sometimes if, it's, if the audience is very wide, it might not be worth discussing. Okay, but pay close attention okay, to the text. It may indicate who the audience, uh, who is the intended audience. <clears throat> okay. Um, is there a significance between you as an actual reader and the implied reader? Okay. Now, remember that texts might be written for a very specific audience. Okay. Um, and that you would identify, or you as the actual reader, how are uh, the effects affecting you specifically? And then they say, what are your ideas about the text producer? Okay. And I always tell my students, you know, try and imagine what the, the, the author looks like. You know, what did they have for breakfast? We would never know. Okay. But we're trying to, through the text, kind of get an understanding of who the writer is as well. Because if we can imagine that the writer, uh, you know, is a certain type, it might help us, uh, and you know, help us in the things that we need to look for in the text. Okay, um, audience uh, and purpose. So you cannot go without purpose. Okay, keep in mind, uh, you know, perhaps to persuade, to inform. Uh, think about your different purposes. Okay, um, think about uh, the um, cultural aspects of the text. Okay, uh, you know, in, in terms of does the reader need to have prior knowledge or shared values or beliefs in order to understand the whole text? Okay, uh, Lexus and semantics. So what language, what words has the writer used? Why have they used those certain types of words in a certain way? Okay. Um, you know, what are the explicit and connotat connotative effects, okay, created by some of the choices of the words that the writer has chosen? Okay. Um, uh, have they used any technical or specialized language? Um, common semantic fields or lexical fields? Okay, is there any uh, socialect within it? Okay, does it use just standard English? Are there any other strange words? And these would normally be indicated in a piece of text, uh, most probably uh, in some sort of an italics. Okay. Um, sentence structures, okay, are they simple, compound, complex, uh, any declarative or interrogative or imperatives within the text, okay, how are the words and the phrases put together, okay, uh, are there any modifiers, what types of verbs, adjectives, adverbs are being used, okay, um, how is the text structured? Structured, okay. Patterns, um, you know, look for patterns always in a text. Is there any sound used? So kind of anatomia, but writers through uh, you know imagery and figurative language they can create sound. Okay, um, I mean, in terms of visual aspects of a text, you're not going to get any pictures. 
Okay, um, but again, through figurative language, uh, you might be able to see kind of uh, you know the 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 uh, they may be trying to create a certain amount of imagery. Okay, so these are just some of the things in that that you want to ask yourself when you're going into textual analysis. Okay, if you've got any other questions, pop them in the, the text box below. Um, okay, I hope some of this was helpful to you. Um, and thank you very much.